I will now uh, introduce Ilva Tashtrem Blomqvist to take over as a moderator, and you will do this better than me. <laughs> Ilva is a pediatric nurse since 25 years. She, uh, can we have her bio slide, please? On, uh, um, she is a researcher and associate professor at the Department of Women's and Children's Health in Uppsala in Sweden. And her research is about parenting, skin-to-skin -skin contact, and breastfeeding. And currently, she is the head nurse responsible for nursing care, for research, for education, and development in the NICU in Uppsala. Thank you very much. And it's an honor and a pleasure. Where is it? Hello. Tack så jättemycket. Thank you very much for being here today. Ah. Oh. 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 Anyway, don't let this take any time. I just want to introduce Nils. So please welcome here and please introduce yourself. <laughs> See you later. <laughs> yeah. Thank you very much. Yeah. My mind is working. Uh, <laughs> <Yes>. <laughs> thank you very much. Uh, and uh, thank you Magdalena and Andre. Uh, and Stina for uh, bringing their story to us. This kind of story tells us why we're here, and uh, we can easily forget that. Uh, I want to thank uh, Stina and uh, Agnes, also especially, uh, for inviting me to uh, present here. Uh, the science of skin-to-skin -skin contact and zero separation, always together, uh, the words we've heard uh, from Heidelis Als, caring for newborn babies together with their parents. And you can hear a deeper kind of parent speaking to us uh, from this presentation. It's not the usual parent by any manner of means. And so there is Magdalena and Andre. I should always have them speaking before I speak. Uh, I don't know if I, I don't know, no, it's not very practical. Uh, I've got a three-year-old uh, grandchild. Uh, it's a full-time job. So, but with this introduction, thank you so much. I'm going to talk about the science of skin-to-skin -skin contact. I hope I shall be able to do so. I need a clock to see. I won't look at the clock. I'll just talk. Yeah. Uh, there it is, there it is. Thank you. So, I'm going to speak about the science what is behind this? And very simply, the first piece I want to say, if you go to sleep after this, the science is that skin-to-skin -skin contact is the right place. Skin-to-skin -skin contact is not a kind of care, it's a place. And when we talk about zero separation, it is zero separation is the wrong place. So skin-to-skin -skin contact and zero separation is two sides of the same coin. It's just a different way of saying it. It's a place that we're looking at. And uh, this uh, was adopted by the World Health Organization. East Asia, half court, one sixth of the world population has this as a policy. And there you see the same always together. And it's the same coin. If you separate, you're stealing. There's nothing. You're taking the coin away. So zero separation policy. This is the India policy. And this is where we are always together. The words also of Heidelis Als. So let me dig into this. And I hope to have about 20 minutes that I talk about science and then what the implications might be. Therefore, uh, the central dogma about any life is DNA. And not to go into details at all, uh, the DNA is the code to life, and we make a brain. More DNA in a brain, everything is summarized by a central dogma. But here, Panksepp, one of my heroes and icons, identifies that it's the place that matters. <laughs> It's the place. Uh, 
Therefore, the environment, he calls it. And therefore, the DNA talks to the environment. And the environment talks to the DNA. And we have the epigenetics and the genome. The brain picks sensory inputs from the environment and makes a full-on connection that we summarize by the concept of a connectome where the brain has experience of the environment in order to behave optimally. And I want to call this nurture science. The science of skin-to-skin -skin contact and zero separation is nurture science. Nurture in English is hard to define but here I've got the dictionary definition. How to bring up somebody uh, like Benjamin here, whose smile you saw at the beginning, into a secure being. There's also the original Latin root, which is to feed, <laughs> nurture, nourishment. Uh, and there's the idea of nature versus nurture. What I want to show is that as I've described nurture science in the very broadest concept, big picture view, we are actually nature or nurture. That's how epigenetics works. <laughs> it's not nature or nurture, it's both. And we're looking at food, how the brain grows and develops and is nourished, not just by nutrition, but also by sensations. And we're looking at a secure being who can behave appropriately in the world. So in the very broadest sense, I feel that nurture is the key. And nurture requires a nurturer, <laughs> a nurturing place. And the mother is both. Anthropologists tell us for species such as primates, the mother is the environment. McKenna, nothing an infant can or cannot do makes sense except in the light of mother's body. Nothing at a cellular level, nothing at a organ, organ level, at a brain level, or in a body level. Nothing an infant can or cannot do makes sense except in the light of mother's body. And you've heard father providing that body too. We will not forget that. But zero separation. The baby knows it only because of skin to skin contact. So, skin-to-skin -skin contact is the right place. What this place does for the newborn, Myron Hofer describes or defines as regulation. Step one, a place for regulation. And these are interactions. Mother's inputs and father's inputs create set points in the physiology of what is the stable, healthy baseline. And it does so at all levels, all sensations, through all times are critical for ensuring the physiological set points and at critical times. No time is more critical than that of birth itself. And here I've got a pictures that you're familiar with, the first hour, how the baby behaves on the breast. And I've called it a highly conserved neuroendocrine behavior, which is an old word for instincts. When you talk about instincts, that doesn't sound very scientific, you know, we don't do instincts. But when we behave in this way, it's because it's deeply embedded in our DNA to behave this way. That DNA wired our neuroendocrine, neurotransmitters, endocrine, to behave in a particular way for reproductive fitness. So this is the fundamental code for life, for living. Not for surviving, but to thrive. And so you're familiar with these nine steps and I just want to share very briefly, you've seen this video, I'm sure, 29 weeks old, uh, 50 minutes of age, and this baby is suckling. This suckling behavior is elicited by zero separation. 
by being in skin-to-skin -skin contact. And uh, Chi has recently given us a 26-weeker that is suckling at two hours of age. This is hardwired into the reproductive fitness of every newborn. We can qualify that later, but for now, suckling, feed, sleep, cycling follows from this. This is research from Karolinska, uh, Hugo Bartocci, others of you. Uh, smell is the key driver. We cannot replicate smell anywhere else. Mother smell. Why mother smell? Because that's where the baby was born from. The reference point is the amniotic fluid. And so that smell and contact provide the continuity. This slide shows a circuit in the brain where smell drives a connection from the emotional amygdala to the social brain. When I was at medical school, emotions were taught at two, three years of age and sociality much later. The brain learns it at birth. It's not just at birth. It's the most fundamental, critical pathway to accomplish reproductive fitness. And so here is Martha Welsh, who's been speaking here to you before, and the scent cloth exposure that produces a single hot spot on the left free prefrontal orbital tract, which is the approach center. This is Heidelis Alsa's uh, early research, and Petra Huppi that we also know. And you can see that the nidcap baby with mother contact makes a connection from the amygdala to the frontal lobe. Here we see there are mirror neurons. Here we see the fusiform gyrus. I'm not explaining the science, I'm just presenting it to you. Are you okay with this? The time is short. This circuit is what makes us human. Our emotionality and our sociality is the platform. Emotional connection. I would love to spend the whole day explaining this in detail. And now I've added mother. And you can hear Magdalena. I trust my senses. Do you remember that? So she has an attuned interaction with her baby. And she got it from being sensitized. The mother brain is also fundamentally altered by immediate skin-to-skin -skin contact. There is a great deal of science here also, the maternal brain and its plasticity in humans. Mothers undergo neurobiological changes and they're extensive. The whole emotional, social, salience brain is not only altered, it increases in gray matter size. It's not insignificant. And this is the parents you've seen speaking before me. And what makes those parents behave that way? And we, the science says, infant cues. The mother wasn't born like that. The infant suckling, vocalizing, touching the breast, massaging the breast. <laughs> the research that uh, uh, you have been conducting here. Connect oxytocin centers of the brain to dopamine centers of the brain. This is the infant priming the parent to parent. And here you see the biology uh, describing this. Dopamine pathways make reward, habit, reward, joy. Oxytocin dopamine systems are parenting systems, and failure to connect them is measurable directly as maternal neglect. How much have we failed parents by not supporting them in connecting dopamine oxytocin pathways? 
because this is actually the reproductive fitness physiology. When we separate mothers from babies, there isn't the stimuli, the sensory inputs that make those connections in the mother brain. We get very, very good mothers, but they work very, very hard doing so. They don't do it easily and naturally. And so we have science to show that uh, purely being born by cesarean section with inevitable separation, if you're born in the United States at least, a cesarean mother responds to a crying baby with stress responses in the brain in contrast to a vaginal birth mother, presumably had more contact with her baby, who responds uh, with uh, dopamine, oxytocin, motivational mechanisms. And again, I'm not going into the detail of the science, only to present the broad picture. The science, mothers need 20 hours of skin-to-skin -skin contact in the beginning to make this connection, because there's a lot of connections that have to be made, <laughs> all of those parts of the brain. And so uh, you saw the mothers they did six hours, and then they did eight hours, uh, and they continued after that. Sensitization and attuned interaction that then allows that emotional connection to grow onwards. This is a smaller side, and you heard also Andre. His brain requires only 30 minutes of skin-to-skin -skin contact to connect dopamine and oxytocin. Uh, it's uh, relatively simple. It, <laughs> the mother needs 20 hours because it's not just oxytocin and dopamine, because she also needs the prolactin and endorphin systems and all the other systems in the brain that are necessary to make this work. And so the father is there also to support in this hour. And what I can add here also as an aside, the baby's brain needs six hours, which is exactly what Benjamin got before the very first time that he took away. So, next key message. The brain doesn't work in isolation. The brain must answer one first question. Am I safe? I'm in the right place. That is how I know I am safe. So, the safe environment is nutrition and reproduction, regulation and sensitization, toxic stress, evokes a defense program that switches off reproductive fitness. And toxic stress is defined as the absence of the buffering protection of adult support. It's not harm. It's absence of good. And therefore, this defense program disrupts brain architecture. I have spoken about this in this very hall before, so I don't need to spend too long. But here's Myron Hofer again, and I show the slide that I showed earlier, the interactions that are regulating. Babies cry because they've lost regulation. That is the distressor. And they know that that sound will bring the mother back. If the mother doesn't come back, it means that she herself is in danger. And therefore, the danger increases. And therefore, I have to self-regulate. I do that by increasing cortisol. Cortisol is my rescue hormone. It's very, very good. It restores stable vital signs. And you think all your children are well because they have stable vital signs, but please measure their cortisol to see if it was cortisol or oxytocin that made those Stable vital signs. Because the difference has to do with what we can call neuroception. Threat appraisal. In a safe environment, it is smell. I have a pointer. It is smell and sounds and touch that leads to a social approach. Unsafe environment, stress. And when I am connecting oxytocin and dopamine... I'm also doing something else. I'm getting control of cortisol. 
Because these three hormones are a single network for behavioral control, reproductive fitness. And only when oxytocin and dopamine are strong enough can I control cortisol. And when I can control cortisol, I can restore emotional functioning. I can lower the levels. Reward means that I can lower cortisol, and when I have low cortisol, I have resilience. Pause. Resilience. The right place. Am I safe? Emotional connection. Resilience. That is the ultimate deliverable, the science of skin-to-skin -skin contact and zero separation. I need resilience, which is the capacity to maintain healthy emotional functioning in the aftermath of a stressful experience. Here's a monkey, a, a peer-reared, separated monkey. Separation, cortisol goes up and up and stays there. A mother-reared monkey, the cortisol goes up, which is very good, but it comes down again. And so this comes down again is resilience. And this reflects also even in other mechanisms than cortisol. Dopamine, oxytocin, immune hormones. And so, time flies here, doesn't it? Five networks are identified in the newborn brain. Also here, France, on 20, 15 years ago in Sweden. And uh, these are resting state networks of a baby. And those resting state networks are the ones that needed to be born, that needed to smell, that needed to approach, that needed to be connected to produce resilience. Resilience comes from this first hour of uninterrupted skin-to-skin -skin contact to accomplish stress resistance, which is resilience. I have sketched in 20 minutes, I used an extra two minutes, as I hope to do, the science of skin-to-skin -skin contact and zero separation. And so, very quickly, how can I go here? Uh, you're going to hear evidence, <laughs> uh, and Mariam uh, is a key part to play in this evidence, I, I'll just whisper that. Uh, and you're going to hear it from Suman, and you're going to hear it from Agnes. What is the novelty that I want to share with respect to this? I have published some papers, one of them together with Björn here and Martha, whose name you saw. The focus, in contrast to early childhood development, is the first thousand seconds and the first thousand minutes, where a host of critical functions are taking place all of which individually we can identify, but all of which collectively lead to nurture. The first thousand seconds. And the objective of this is emotional connection and resilience. Ethics. You heard Heidelis Als refer to primum non nocere, first do no harm. The ethical, technical term for this is called non-maleficence. First, do no harm. Nurture science has a bone to pick with evidence-based medicine. Because evidence-based medicine is risk reduction. And it stops there. Beneficence is a balancing ethical axiom. It's not enough to do no harm. It's also necessary to do good. Failing to do good is unethical. Therefore, the failure to do good, beneficence is a ethical axiom. It is ethically necessary to do good to ensure that babies have the regulation and the emotional connection actively ensuring that parents have their sensitization to enable their attuned parenting. And so, this one, 
randomized controlled trials or evidence-based medicine or first do no harm, absolutely, we should never stop. But it's not enough. It is not enough. And therefore, we also need to see the bigger picture. And so, actively doing good is on health enhancement. This picture shows a pathogenetic model. We kind of think that if I can identify your disease and treat it, you'll go back to being normal. There's a salutogenic model that says leaving it in neutral means that the second law of thermodynamic will push it back into chaos. What is actively necessary is to actively support health. And therefore, there's a salutogenic model. Later today, you're going to hear about physiology-based cord clamping. Physiology is about getting everything right. Pathology, I find one problem and I deal with it. And then I've done well evidence-based medicine. But if my one risk reduction fails to do 10 goods, the final outcome will be worse. And therefore, risk reduction does not achieve resilience. Nurture science is necessary. Cognitive outcomes have not improved in the last 20 years. This is from this last year, end of last year. 100,000 babies, 7,000 premature babies, and you see a gradient profile of, of poorer outcomes. I'm not managing this uh, machine very well. And so, there are obligations of skin-to-skin -skin contact. There were these ethical principles that I shared with you, beneficence and non-maleficence, but there's also justice uh, and respect for autonomy. Problem is, Benjamin, when he's born, doesn't have autonomy. What Benjamin has to have instead is called the best interests principle. And this comes from the convention of the rights of the child. The child's best interests are of paramount importance in every matter concerning the child. And you heard Magdalena saying, what is paramount? You heard her use the very word. And this comes from the Convention of the Rights of the Child. Notice, the highest net benefit, not the highest net reduction of risks, the highest net benefit. Nurture science wants us to think in different terms. And now, this puts obligations on us as adults to be advocates for children. We have obligations to enhance their health, not just to reduce their risks. And so the new WHO guidelines advise skin-to-skin -skin contact with the caregiver should start immediately after birth without any initial period in an incubator. A significant change from earlier guidance and common clinical practice. And I am speaking in Stockholm and Sweden. And I am echoing a parent who had to fight for this. Without being separated, stay close, always together. The best interests of the child are paramount. 20 years ago, a publication said, rather prophetically almost, Joy Brown, the mother and infant at birth are ready to develop optimal attachment relationships. And in the same issue, Robert White, also a NIDCAP doyen, future NICU design should recognize that the baby must spend most of its time in its mother's arms. You're going to hear practically today in this conference how that is going to happen. Uh, practice. The premise, and then you're going to hear a promise. The premise of skin-to-skin -skin contact is that you can trust nature and you can trust nurture. You can trust parents and you can trust their babies. And the promise 
of skin-to-skin -skin contact and zero separation is that nurture signs will improve neonatal outcomes. Thank you. Thank you very much. Oh, it's, it's working. <laughs> it's fantastic. <laughs> uh, it's an honor, and please stay with me here. Uh, you, you, I, I can say that I have one dream, that uh, we should never separate infants from their parents. And I also have another dream, that I, I want to be on stage together with Nils Bergman. <laughs> so here I am today. Uh, I want to thank you, the organization committee, for, for doing this. It's, uh, I feel really uh, honored and humbled, hu and humbled to be here today. And I also want to thank Benjamin's parents for sharing their story with all of us. I feel, I almost start crying when I heard them. And I also feel some kind of angry because we are still trying to, uh, we, we are still telling parents that maybe you should take a walk or take some coffee and leave your infant here and we take care of your infant and I feel sad about that. And I also want to thank you, Nils, because it's always some kind of hallelujah moment <laughs> to, to hear you speak. Um, but um, uh, always when I working, both at the clinic and at the university, I, I want to do everything that I can do to make it better for infants and parents uh, when the infant is in need of care at the NICU. And I sometimes uh, can't sleep during the night, and I have a lot of questions when I'm uh, lying there awake, three or four or five at the night, and thinking. And I want to take uh, the opportunity to reflect about this together with you. And I have two really huge questions about this. And it's everything is about how can we do it better in the beginning of the, the infant's lives. And the first, uh, dear Nils, if, if given that you only have one or two or three minutes, maximum three minutes, to, to <laughs> give me the answer of my first question. Um, here in Sweden, we have a fantastic parental leave and uh, the Convention of the Rights of the Child is a law here in Sweden. What's stopping us? Why do we still separate infants in need of care at the NICU? from the parents. Mm. Uh, two minutes. <laughs> <laughs> Just before I started talking, Ulva threatened me with this question. And then I had to talk, so what chance have I had to think about your question? <laughs> and if I had an easy answer, uh, you would also, it wouldn't be that difficult. What's stopping us? There was a time when my answer was the Semmelweis reflex. Semmelweis went insane because he couldn't tell his colleagues why it worked to wash your hands. Even now, people don't wash their hands properly. Uh, I would like to feel that that no longer applies. But there's quite a long lag between knowing a science and changing practice. Uh, 9 to 13 years, I think, is the systematic review answer for how evidence takes time to become practice. We've been at this for 40 years. Yes. <laughs> I think also that it's not just, it's not just an evidence-based medicine. We've got cornered into a way of thinking where uh, we are reductionist. And what I'm presenting here is that why we have a mindset that doesn't take the big picture. A and, and I think your conference has been able to present the bigger picture uh, as in parents making these testimonies very beautifully. But nevertheless, the paradigm is not a step because you're going to fall into the ditch because the ditch is wider then you can leap it in one step. So I think Björn uh, puts this also, uh, we have worked together, uh, when we implemented, how was my two minutes? When we implemented this immediate kangaroo mother care study, 
we worked on systems change, profound systems change. <laughs> uh, and we had to gate crash it. We had to fast track it. Uh, and it was very challenging. Uh, and we had $7 million of help uh, and the expertise of Ravajiv Bell. Uh, profound systems change is actually necessary. Uh, and this was just for a study. Now we're looking to change a practice. Maybe that's my two minutes. Uh, uh, yes. <laughs> but but I'm still wondering, uh, why doesn't it work at the clinic? When I was... When I we're working at the NICU tomorrow morning. I am sure we all we say still have a lot of infants separated from the parents, and I just can't uh, mm -hmm. imagine why. Uh, so some of this, the parents are victims of our systems. Yeah. Uh, and uh, I'm a public health physician. I'm probably most to blame. <laughs> we have a health system that forces us into ruts and molds and forces you to obey the particular social students and fear can't get. Excuse me. Uh, so so, so uh, we need to make systems change. Yes, those can't be changed by an individual who knows the truth. We need to be working together. There's a new WHO guideline. There's an old Convention of the Rights of the Child. There's a human rights issue. What's stopping us? Actually, right now, there's a critical mass in this room that needs to take the step out and say, what are the systems changes we need to make? Uh, the evidence is there, the science is there, the skills are there. You're going to hear them all this afternoon. We know how. Yeah. And we also know that if the parents get the chance, they want to do this. Just like we heard Mag Benjamin's parents told us. And then they become parents that we don't like. <laughs> yeah. Because they're difficult. One of the effects of oxytocin in the brain is to switch off your cingulate gyrus, and it creates ferocity of defense of young. Yeah. So, so could it be that easy if uh, we just make a system change and a clinical practice change, that if we never separate any infants from their parents, we would save a lot of time and effort for the staff. We don't need to, to create a lot of programs to make them together again, because we never separate them. Ask your question again. Yes, some kind of question. Clarify One minute. your question. <laughs> you can have another minute because <laughs> my answer is going to be yes. Uh, if, if, <laughs> if, if we never ever separate any infant from the parents, uh, could it possibly be that way that, that we as a staff save a lot of time? Because we, don't need, we, we save a lot of time here after some uh, hours or, or days because we don't need to... to uh, lay a lot of effort to make them together again. So a lot of programs. If you never separated mothers and fathers from their babies, they would profoundly change. Nevertheless, mothers and fathers come into the situation needing our support still to change. They can have baggage. They can have epigenetic settings from them having also not been born. So let's not be naive about your answer. At a public health level, the answer is going to be yes, only <laughs> you are going to do less useless things. You're going to be twice as busy mm. doing good, yeah. ensuring benefits. So it's not about getting out of work. We don't want that. Uh, we want to do good work. Yeah. And I also think, in my clinical experience, is that, that if we don't separate, it's taking much more time for the parents in the beginning, uh, from, from the staff in the beginning, mm -hmm. because we need to take care of both the infant and the parents. But we save a lot of time later on. And the end result is that we're proud of our babies, how they survived, 
But I don't think it works. Uh, I'm working it. Oh, yes. 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 <laughs> uh, and, and, and so, what are the benefits? I, I, I've lost it. Let's not uh, take it off. The babies, it's the outcomes that we work for. We want to work efficiently and effectively for better outcomes, yeah. not less work. <laughs> better outcomes. Those better outcomes are going to come from better parents. Better outcomes for both the parents and the infants? Absolutely. Absolutely. Yeah. And I think that uh, our time together <laughs> is finished now because uh, the, the clock is 10 o'clock and uh, we have some time for Swedish fika. And I, I want to have some slide here to say thank you very much to, to Nils. Yes. So thank you very much, Nils, and thank it's you. an honor to listen to you. <laughs> thank you. <very> much. <laughs> and I think it's 30 minutes. I know it's 30 minutes of FICA right now. Uh, 10. Be, be back before half past 10, so we'll go back to track. Thank you.